on Christmas Eve in 1945, the home of George Sauter, his wife, Jenny, and nine of their ten children was destroyed in a fire. Five of the children didn't make it out. No remains were recovered, and nobody knows what happened to them. This is Monsters Mysteries. Giorgio Sudu was born in Tula, Sardinia, and immigrated with his older brother to the United States when he was only 13 years old. After arriving in the U.S., his brother turned around and went back to Italy, leaving Giorgio, who now went by George Sauter, all alone in a strange new land. He managed to find work, bringing water to laborers on the Pennsylvania railroads, and after a few years, he moved to West Virginia. George had begun working as a truck driver and eventually started his own trucking company. He hauled dirt for construction sites and coal for local mines. Jenny Cipriani had immigrated to the U.S. from Italy when she was only three years old. Her father owned a small store in Smithers, West Virginia, and one day, George Sauter walked in and met Jenny. Over the years, George's business did well and the Sauters became one of the most well-respected families in the area. Not only was he known for his business, but because of his strong opinions and the fact that he was vocal about his dislike for Benito Mussolini. The couple had ten children between 1923 and 1943. By the time their last child was born, their second oldest son, Joe, had joined the military and was serving in World War II. The eventual defeat and execution of Mussolini caused some friction between George and the other people in the area which was heavily populated with Italian immigrants. In October of 1945, an insurance salesman showed up at their house. When George declined purchasing a policy from the man, he became angry and said to George that his house, quote, would go up in smoke and your children are going to be destroyed, end quote. He claimed that it would happen due to, quote, the dirty remarks you have been making about Mussolini, end quote. Another incident happened when a man showed up looking for work. He suggested that George pay him to fix their fuse box and that it would catch fire if it wasn't replaced. Mr. Sauter turned him down because he had recently had the house rewired when he added an electric stove to the kitchen, and the electric company had inspected the fuse box and said it was safe. In the weeks before Christmas, some of the older Sauter children had noticed a car parked on the highway and claimed that it had been watching the younger children as they were returning home from school. On Christmas Eve 1945, George and two of the older sons, 23-year-old John and 16-year-old George Jr., were already asleep. Jenny told the younger kids that they could stay up as long as they remembered to bring in the cows and close the chicken coop before they went to bed. She then took two-year-old Sylvia and went to bed. At 12.30 a.m., there was a wrong number call that Jenny answered. Some speculate that this call may have something to do with the upcoming incident, but police tracked down the woman who had called and she assured them that it was truly just a wrong number. Jenny was awoken again at 1 a.m. to the sounds of something hitting the roof. She reported a loud thump and then what sounded like something rolling down the roof. After the noise stopped, she fell back asleep but was awoken 30 minutes later to the smell of smoke. She realized the house was on fire and noted that it was in the room that George used as an office, which was near the fuse box. She said she yelled up the stairs to the children and John and George Jr. were the only two who came down. John would initially report to the police that he did shake his brothers and sisters in an effort to wake them up, but later changed his story, saying he only yelled for them. Both adults and four of their children escaped the fire right away. The children that made it out of the house were John, 17-year-old Marion, George Jr., and Sylvia. The children that went missing were 14-year-old Maurice, 12-year-old Martha, 9-year-old Louis, 8-year-old Jenny, and 5-year-old Betty. They had called to the other children who were still in the attic but weren't able to wake them. They tried to call the fire department, but their phone didn't work, so their oldest daughter, Marion, ran to a neighbor's house and used their phone. George and his two sons, John and George Jr., went to use a ladder they kept on the side of the house to rescue the rest of the children from the attic. 
George was able to climb the side of the house and break a window, cutting his arm in the process. But when the sons went to retrieve the ladder, it was gone. George decided to pull his work trucks up to the house and use them to rescue the kids, but neither truck would start. George would later explain that both of his trucks were in perfect working order and had started just fine the previous day. Over the next 45 minutes, the surviving family watched in horror as the house burned and collapsed. The fire department didn't arrive until 8 a.m., and by that time there was nothing they could do. Due to the war, the fire department was understaffed and relied on all volunteers. Even if they'd gotten there sooner, they didn't have breathing apparatuses like they do today, so they wouldn't have been able to go into the burning house. The volunteer firefighters searched the ash that was left, and the family was told that no remains were found. The fire marshal, Chief F.J. Morris, deemed it an electrical fire and that the remaining five children perished in the blaze. The Sodders had a hard time accepting this, though. Over the next few months, more and more questions would arise. They questioned how it was possible for five bodies to completely burn up with no bones remaining. Jenny contacted an employee at a local crematorium who told her that a body burning at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit for two hours would still leave bones. That was longer and hotter than the fire at their house. More recent interviews with firefighters claimed that the fire did actually burn for longer than two hours because it was still smoldering when the volunteers arrived at 8 a.m. They questioned why their Christmas lights stayed on during the first half of the fire. If it was an electrical fire, they would have gone out immediately. As someone who spent most of his life working in the construction industry and has had an electrical fire in a previous home, that's actually not true. It would all depend on where the electrical fire started and what the fire had damaged. The police, however, eventually withdrew their claim that the fire started due to electrical failure, and most believe that the fire started on the roof. They found their missing ladder at the bottom of an embankment about 75 feet away from the home. A telephone repairman informed them that their phone line had not been burned through, causing the phone to not work the night of the fire. In fact, it had been cut at the top of the telephone pole. Also, witnesses saw a man stealing a block and tackle, which is a type of lifting system that uses pulleys, from one of the buildings on the Sodder property the night of the fire. The man later confessed to the theft, stating that he used the ladder to climb the pole and cut the power line, but must have cut the telephone line by mistake. He said he did steal the block and tackle from the property, but insisted that he had nothing to do with the fire. George insisted that someone must have tampered with his truck in order for it to not start that morning. Others believed that it was just too cold and the boys flooded the engines while they were trying to get them started. A bus driver claimed he saw people throwing balls of fire at the house. A few months later, Sylvia was playing in the yard and found a hard, green, rubber-like ball with a twist-off cap. Military officials identified it as a grenade used as an incendiary device. This must have been the sound that Jenny had heard that morning. The Sodders hired a private investigator named C.C. Tinsley to look into the case. He learned that the insurance salesman who had threatened them with a fire the previous year over George's remarks about Mussolini had been on the coroner's jury that ruled the fire an accident. The same private investigator found that the fire marshal had found remains in the ash that night but didn't tell the Sodders. He found internal organs which he placed in a box and buried on their property. When they dug up the box, they took the box to a funeral director who reported that the box contained a very fresh beef liver that had never been exposed to fire. Some people believe that the box was planted to convince the Sodders that their children did die in the fire. George was asked by Morris to leave the site alone until they were able to return and search some more, but only four days later he bulldozed the site and covered it with dirt in order to turn it into a memorial for his children. In August of 1949, the Sodders decided to do another search of the property where the fire had happened. The excavation of the area uncovered several pieces of human vertebrae which were sent to the Smithsonian Institute for evaluation. The Smithsonian responded with this report. The human bones consisted of four lumbar vertebrae belonging to one individual. Since the transverse recesses are fused, the age of this individual at death would have been 16 or 17 years. The top limit age should be about 22 since the centra, which normally fuse at 23, are still unfused. 
On this basis, the bones show greater skeletal maturation than ones expected for a 14-year-old boy, the oldest missing solder child. It is, however, possible, although not probable, for a boy 14 and a half years old to show 16 to 17 maturation. Additionally, the bones showed no signs that they had been exposed to a fire, and it was determined that they were most likely already in the fill dirt that George brought in to fill the basement and create a memorial for his children. George spent the next 20 years investigating any sighting of the children. They put up a giant sign in town with a $10,000 reward and posted flyers everywhere. George began traveling all over the country, investigating possible sightings of the children. George had seen a photo in a magazine of a group of children in New York City and he was sure that one of them was Betty. He traveled to Manhattan in search of answers but the girl's parents refused to talk to him. They received a letter claiming Martha was living in a convent in St. Louis, Missouri. A man in Texas claimed to have overheard someone at a bar talking about a Christmas Eve fire in West Virginia. Someone else claimed that the children were living with distant relatives of Jenny's in Florida. None of the tips led to any answers. There was an immediate sighting of the kids in a car driving away from the fire that night, and a waitress claimed she served them breakfast at a restaurant about 50 miles away from their home the following morning. That waitress said they were in a car with Florida license plates. The Sodders had family in Florida, and it was believed that if the kids were kidnapped, family members would have been involved. Their family in Florida was questioned and even made to provide evidence that their children were not the Sodder children. A woman claimed to have seen the five children at a local hotel she worked at a week after the fire. She said, quote, They were with two men and two women, of Italian extraction, end quote. She said she tried to talk to the children, but one of the men became hostile and wouldn't allow them to speak to her. In 1967, the Sodders received a letter that was postmarked from Central City, Kentucky. It contained a picture of a young man who looked like it could be Lewis if he survived the fire. On the back of the picture, it read, Lewis Sodder, I love brother Frankie, little boys, A9013, with the last character either being a 2 or a 5. There was no explanation for the writing on the back of the picture. They didn't know who Frankie was referring to, and those other lines remained a mystery. The Sodders hired another private investigator to go to Central City and try to get some answers regarding the picture. The man they hired ended up taking their money and never returned. There was no Sodder child named Frankie, and nothing else written on the back of the picture was ever decoded. Most people believe the picture was just a cruel prank, but it was the last clue they would ever receive about their children. In 1969, George Sauter died, but Jenny and four of the surviving children continued to search for answers. Jenny wore black for the rest of her life as a sign of mourning, and she continued to tend to the garden that had been planted in honor of the children. Jenny died in 1989, and the family finally took down the large billboard they had placed in town offering a reward for information. John Sauter was the only surviving family member who would not talk about the incident. He encouraged his family to accept it and move on. Is it because he did shake his brothers and sisters that night and knows they died in the fire? Or is it because he didn't try to wake them up and is too full of guilt to talk about it? It seems clear that the home was intentionally set on fire. The noise on the roof, the incendiary device found in the yard, the eyewitness seeing people throwing flaming balls onto the roof, and the fact that the electrical fire conclusion ended up getting dismissed. The biggest question is whether or not the five solder children survived that night. If they survived, they had been kidnapped, which leads us to question who would take them. One theory is the Italian mafia took them because they were upset about George's disdain for Mussolini. Many people point out that Mussolini was taken down by the Italians and wasn't so popular that they felt someone would carry out an act of vengeance on the Sodders over it. Especially not the Mafia, since Mussolini had actively tried to destroy the Mafia. Some believe they were actually trying to shake George down and he refused to pay so they kidnapped the kids and burned down the house in retaliation. This may be a more likely theory, but some people ask why the Mafia would kidnap the children. Maybe the Italian Mafia just burned down the house and didn't kidnap the children and they did die in the fire. There are claims that the family members from Florida were involved in kidnapping the children. What would the reason be? Why did they only take some of the children and not the others?
and why would they never try to contact their family if they remained alive? If they were killed after being kidnapped, why? There's no way to get these answers, but it just seems so random that it doesn't make sense. Some people also think that the children were kidnapped before the fire. After the incident, it was revealed that the cows had not been brought in and the chicken coop had not been closed. If the children were asleep inside, that means they failed to complete their chores. Now, a child forgetting his chores is not anything unreasonable, but some believe that the five children went outside to complete their chores and were kidnapped before the house was set on fire. It explains why the five children that stayed up late were the same five children that went missing. That could also be because those five children were harder to wake up because they had stayed up late. Nobody knows. Some people believe that the five missing children perished in the fire. Maybe John was telling the truth about shaking his brothers and sisters, but maybe they were already dead from smoke inhalation. Only the two older children who were in the attic made it out alive. The younger children would have succumbed to smoke inhalation faster, and if the fire started on the roof, they would have been exposed to it first. The biggest questions revolved around whether or not there were human remains in the burned down remains of the house. Firefighters questioned after the incident, including one of Jenny Sauter's brothers, said that they did find remains but didn't tell the Sauters. They claimed that they did find human organs in with the ash which current fire experts say is very likely. More recent interviews with firefighters say that the two-hour search for remains was far too short to actually find anything, and the fact that the volunteers were not properly trained to know what to look for means they most likely missed the remains. Nowadays, the search would take days with highly trained investigators. Firefighters who discuss this case these days show very little doubt that there were remains in the debris and they were just missed. My opinion? I think that someone set their house on fire out of retaliation for something. The insurance salesman is at the top of my list for that. I think the thief stole the block and tackle, which is why the telephone line was cut and the ladder was moved. The insurance salesman may have disabled the trucks, or it may have just been too cold. It was the end of December, after all. I think the five children were knocked out from smoke inhalation in the attic and died in the fire. The inside of the house would have collapsed, and the exterior walls would have come in on top of them, completely burying their bodies in smoldering debris. I think the quick search by untrained volunteer firefighters is why no remains were recovered. George quickly covered the area with dirt, so even though they went back and tried to search again, he had covered the area where the basement was with five feet of fill dirt. There was no way they would have found anything after that. That's my opinion. Leave your theories in the comments. On April 21, 2021, the last of the surviving Sauter children, Sylvia Sauter Paxton, passed away. She was 79 years old. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Be safe. Thanks so much for watching this video. You can help us out by hitting the like button or leaving us a comment. You can also subscribe to the show to ensure you don't miss an episode. Also, remember that if you'd like to support the show, the easiest way is to donate a few bucks at Buy Me A Coffee or check out some of our merchandise at Teespring. You can find information on how to do that along with links to our social media at thisismonsters.com. Thanks again.